go, especially um, wind and solar, but some of the battery storage technology that um, we're getting from Elon Musk and those sort of people is very exciting. Um, I don't harbour a lot of hope in our region. Certainly the peak industry groups like the Chamber of Commerce, Advanced Cairns, um, in discussions with them, they're saying, uh, we just want the cheapest power, we don't really care how it's generated. And, um, and likewise, we're seeing even the Labor government in Queensland uh, expanding and developing the Bowen Basin, which is the biggest uncapped coal reserve um, in the nation. So uh, it just uh, doesn't seem there's that political or corporate leadership um, to push us down that renewable path. Well, certainly I would be opposing, as I did when I was um, for a parliament, uh, the opening of any new coal mines. And uh, you hear the LNP and some of these other groups say silly things like, you want to close down the coal mines. And, no, we don't want to close down the coal mines. We just think it's crazy to be opening new massive coal mines at a time we need to be transitioning away from fossil fuels. Well, I think you need a mix. And, and the, the other thing you hear people saying who, who, who are more hostile is that um, when, when it's not, um, when there's no sunshine and there's no wind, the renewables don't work. Well, that's why we have battery storage. Um, but, but there's different opportunities in different areas. In the Torres Strait, I think there'd be uh, great opportunities for uh, harnessing the power of the tide as well. And, uh, and different uh, different types of renewables. Um, I'm just trying to uh, think about solar thermal and these sort of things I think are very exciting as well. And to, to, to think that we're not capable of doing this is really ridiculous because it's already been done. And uh, the tragedy for me is rather than being a leader and uh, getting in at a very um, profound technological level, uh, which Australia could have done, and become an exporter of these technologies, we're now a follower. So we'll be, um, we'll be importing technology and, uh, and different energy uh, generation uh, means that have already been pioneered uh, in Germany, in Holland, and in those countries. So, um, you know, I often think of politics in terms of uh, which way is Australia going to go towards a more progressive European sort of model or towards the United States. And I fear it's. Uh, we're more in Trump territory in Australia than not, I'm afraid, and I find that incredibly depressing. Well, the frustrating thing for me about having sort of campaigned against that uh, jobs and growth rhetoric is it, it actually doesn't mean anything when you're saying the words jobs and growth. Uh, where is the jobs and growth in Cairns? Where, well, what is a delivery for Cairns? It's not delivering anything. Uh, but yet the, the argument wins. Oh, we're trying to create jobs and grow the economy and new people are just the spoilers. Well, they're not trying to grow anything. Uh, all they're concerned about is their own re-election. And I've got to say, it's a tactic that's successful uh, because jobs and growth tends to, uh, you know, that's what uh, um, Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull ran with jobs and growth, and they managed to get re-elected in the end. That's all they care about. So I think there's enormous potential in Cairns and far north Queensland in terms of um, education, health, um, talking about expertise uh, in many areas. See, the unique opportunity we have here is Cairns is a developed uh, first world city in the tropics. Um, in the torrid zone or the tropical areas around the globe, we have countries going from third world status to second world to first world. And as they progress, they're looking uh, to acquire the skills, whether it's in building roads in tropical areas, um, tropical medicine, these are all things that we are world leaders in. So we should be focusing on those areas, creating jobs, and we don't even know where half of these jobs are going to come from. But if we're working in that higher end area of PhD research and, uh, and higher education, uh, we can actually make the discoveries that we can explore all around the world. And you know, I've heard people say, oh, not everyone can be a PhD student, not everyone can be a scholar, not everyone can be an academic. No, but the people that are at the technological forefront also need their houses built, they need plumbers, they need electricians, and, and that's uh, and it's very frustrating when you see all these opportunities, uh, especially, I think, as early adopters of uh, new technology, you get ahead of the curve. Um, why couldn't Cairns have been the next Silicon Valley? Why couldn't we have uh, embraced those technological uh, opportunities and supported that industry? 
And as an member for Cairns, I saw all those sort of opportunities. And what do I hear when I go go back to uh, local discussion? Oh, you're not digging enough mud out of the inlet. You've got to dredge the inlet more. And it's like, come on. You know, what's, what's the matter with the mentality of people that make it? We live in such an exciting time with such opportunities and they dumb everything down, you know? Very frustrating. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think, I think uh, just that is, there's so many reasons uh, to be excited and, uh, and to be embracing a lot of the technological change and the disruption that's occurring. Uh, a lot of it is also quite frightening. And uh, I witnessed that uh, with the taxi industry, with the, with the Uber coming in and taking people, people's taking people's livelihoods there. And um, I'd like to say that I, I can see uh, I can see some sort of safety net for people, but I can't. Um, these big corporations are incredibly powerful, and I don't think there's a will uh, whether our governments can actually uh, help uh, in terms of either regulation or opportunities or or uh, supporting um, local independent uh, retailers or, or small family businesses. It's, uh, it's very concerning and um, yeah, I don't know. What, what solutions do you see? Because I can't see it. I think it's, it's, it is, the ch pace of change is so quick. Um, so let, let's not assume that these big um, corporations like Facebook and Amazon uh, won't themselves fall victim to disruption. So um, who knows where we'll be in a few years. Well look, people often ask me if it's too late to get involved in Bitcoin and the like. And I think the question they should be asking is, is it too early? And I say that because if you look around in Cairns and, and, and see where there are services or businesses that accept Bitcoin as payment, you find very, very few indeed. So it is once at the retail level and in terms of paying for goods and services, uh, once people start accepting Bitcoin, uh, you're going to see more and more people get online uh, and using Bitcoin. And I think there are tremendous uh, advantages. Uh, look, probably in terms of Australia and first world countries, not so much, but there's about two billion people in the world who are unbanked and don't have access to financial services. Um, will be very much embracing that, and particularly in currencies where the the, um, the fiat currency of the nation is not stable as it is, well, as stable as it is in Australia, uh, people will leave national currencies uh, because they don't have the purchasing power. But I think um, a gentleman named Daryl Killen introduced me to the blockchain, and I didn't really understand it, and I still don't fully understand it, but it's enough that I know um, that the science is is rock solid, that it's immutable, that transactions are immutable, and it's um, decentralised. So, yeah, I, I can't I can't see how most um, services won't transition to the blockchain. Um, I was just looking at a new startup today, um, e token, and that's about Airbnb and moving those services uh, onto the blockchain, uh, so that people are interacting one one-on-one -on -one with each other. And um, yeah, people have come to me and said, oh, can you help me get some cryptocurrencies? Well, no, that's the whole purpose. You, there is no middle man. You get it yourself, hop online. And, uh, and I think, um, yeah, it's really exciting. I think there'll be about one-fifth of the jobs in banks and financial institutions in the next 10 years. Uh, that's how, how much it'll revolutionize. And that's, you know, that's gonna have some pretty dire um, human consequences for people working in the banking se sector and other areas, but uh, likewise for many of the um, jobs performed by uh, legal firms. I think as the blockchain takes over, people will be transacting with each other. And that's right, and that's where centralised companies like Amazon uh, will, will come under risk when there are decentralised applications. Uh, that can do um, similar things. Really? So, well, I think uh, what is happening now is you're seeing companies like Amazon talking to some of the uh, cryptocurrency uh, operators like uh, Ripple is one that has a very fast transaction time and they're saying, well, we may be a partner with Ripple. So, and likewise, you're seeing with many of the big banks and financial corporations is they're saying publicly, don't trust cryptocurrency, don't have anything to do with it. Um, but behind the scenes, they're actually 
buying cryptocurrency and, and uh, in some cases uh, establishing their own cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's very interesting where we are at the moment. It's not very positive. Like I mentioned before, um, the Chamber of Commerce advanced cans and the local council and how they're not really interested in the issue of climate change. They're certainly not proactive on it. And um, I guess more concerning for me is groups like the tourism operators who, um, who you'd like to think uh, valued the reef and wanted to care for the place. Uh, if for no other reason than for their own financial viability into the future, um, they're still denying um, the extent of coral bleaching, saying climate change is not an issue, come to the reef, it's in great shape. Well, this is clearly manifestly untrue. And, um, and, and I think, uh, unfortunately, like I was elected to council in 2008, and uh, even prior to that, I was very aware of climate change and implications. And uh, back in 2008, they were talking about what would happen in terms of temperature increases, in terms of more intense uh, natural disasters. And of course, all of this is happening uh, because it's science. And, uh, and it's not something that's a matter of political opinion. Uh, it, it's a scientific reality we have to live with. And there has been eminent opportunity uh, for levels of government and for our community as a whole uh, to reform and to change and to transition away from fossil fuels um, to prevent the adverse impact of these climate changes. And we haven't done that. Um, it's not like we weren't on notice uh, in terms of our political leaders, in terms of our people, of the need to transition away, yet we haven't done it. So that's why we're entering now a period known as the Anthropocene. Uh, which will be, which will be um, the most common aspects, of which will be the mass extinction of species, uh, sea level rise, um, and increasingly um, climate change uh, in terms of the apocalyptic um, natural disasters that we will see happen, and, uh, and the warming temperatures will increase and it will get hotter. Um, I guess the possibilities for mankind now range from bad uh, to very bad. Uh, it doesn't mean we give up, we should all be trying to do something because uh, the difference between bad and very bad uh, could be uh, millions of lives and the extinction of uh, even more species uh, of other species that inhabit the planet, so pretty scary. Um, I think you'll see most of the CBD um, underwater during peak tides um, by 2050. Um, you know, I think we're in, we're in new territory, we don't really know, but um, in terms of extinction of species, I'm thinking uh, in the wet tropic areas, uh, one or two degree temperatures will um, impact on a lot of uh, species that live at the high levels, and uh, we'll see a lot of them go. Um, even now we're seeing, uh, on very, very hot days, uh, massive die-offs of flying foxes. So, um, you know, I think, uh, the natural habitat's been the big thing for the fly fox, but it'll be those high temperatures, I think, that will... And, uh, and again, many people in Cairns be happy about that. And uh, that's, that's the tragedy I, uh, I live with as a local um, politician. I think we're a very polarised community, um, whether it's to do with uh, conservative environment, race, or whatever. Um, I don't see Cairns as a um, community in terms of a... Uh, a viable, sort of self-supporting, sustainable, um, healthy entity. Um, for example, you, you might have heard the say it takes a whole community to, um, to raise a child. In Cairns, for example, uh, especially a lot of our Indigenous young people, um, many in the community just condemn them and are very punitive. Um, and uh, we've seen that just yesterday uh, with many uh, local people calling for the flogging and, uh, and uh, incarceration of really quite young children. And uh, it's quite an unhealthy dynamic. Um, in terms of significance of race, for example, um, I would see very strong support from the uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community, whereas a lot of hostility, especially from elderly white males. So there's these interesting demographic things happening as well. Um, really, it's funny too when, when I see that because typically these elderly white male baby boomers. Um, they talk in the aspect of, well, I've worked hard all my life and everyone's bludging off me, which is quite laughable. They had free access to university education. Their pensions were generous. They had very well paid award wages. And kids today don't have that. So they're actually the ones that have uh, had it well. 
and uh, other people today really struggle. Well, I think I think it just gets back to the issues around governance again, and that's people think, oh well, let's do this, let's have a rail motor, let's do this. It doesn't matter what the member for Cairns wants. It doesn't matter what the local council wants. The plans are there. Um, the future of public transport in Cairns will be the Cairns Transit Network. So anyone who wants to see the future of public transport can look up Cairns Transit Network and see what the department's doing. But the department's doing that. It doesn't matter what people watching this video want. That's what will happen. Um, yeah, it looks, it looks fairly good. Uh, the first stage we've seen with the opening up of Lake Street in the CBD, um, that'll go down to Spence, uh, and then that'll open a, and a lot of the people who um, who are passionate about public transport don't like it because it's a bus operated system. Um, but it's going to be a bus operated system. It doesn't matter if you don't like it. Uh, you know, people think the member for Cairns gets to decide these things. The member for Cairns gets to vote on legislation in the state parliament, um, the laws that affect the state as a whole. The council hasn't got the resources, they'll do what they're told. Um, a lot, lot of, um, still a lot of talent around the health and wellbeing of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, you know, I'd like to think we could go back to uh, having you know, more community gardens. See, the problem I see is people, you know, the old thing of uh, milk comes from the shopping centre, uh, coals, where the, the total disconnection uh, from the food we're eating. Uh, and, and that's, you know, you're talking about uh, drugs as well. You know, when it comes to drugs, everyone focuses on uh, the ice or whatever. Um, these, these drugs are often used um, to address sociological, uh, social, uh, psychological trauma people have in their lives. Um, so we need to have more healthy communities so people aren't suffering and find the need to turn to drugs. And, um, as long as we've got so many people in our community alienated, alienated from education, from work, to the opportunities that life happens, we're going to have people turning to drugs. So it's a massive issue. I don't think it's one that can be addressed in isolation. Yeah. So yeah, well, there are so many people in Cairns who have been um, who have missed out on the opportunities that education has um, to offer, and who have um, disabilities, um, who, who lack um, the capacity to participate. Uh, in community, and um, and they turn to they turn to drugs. And that's um, I think you know one of my frustrations was not getting more um, getting the state government to fund more programs in West Cairns, so that people could have um, a reason to get up every morning and something to do where they interact with others. Look to, to cut through to the to the root of the problem. Uh, as human beings, we have evolved over a millennia with two things remaining constant. Our contact with the natural environment and our contact with other animals as tribal beings, members of the tribe. Um, all of a sudden, that stopped. Um, you can't stop something that's been an inherent aspect of human um, development over a millennia and not expect people to have mental disorders, to have psychological problems and to need to address it in some way, which they're doing by turning to drugs. And um, yeah, it's, it's when people see the drugs. Including drug alcohol. Them. Exactly. And uh, and when people see that as in isolation, we haven't seen uh, the bigger problem. I think, uh, yeah, that, that is the problem.